Where you live matters. Your zip code can predict your health more than your genetic code. And we know this through research in public health. So as you live in communities that are segregated and isolated away from more affluent communities, we know that there is less opportunity for health, uh, access to uh, medical care, access to great schools, access to great jobs and great paying jobs. And so if you're not allowed to own your own home in a community and be part of the community, that will contribute to your health. And history matters to health. Housing and, and the housing system is, is not a simple thing to unpack. Um, the history of housing is not a simple thing. And the implications of it become far more reaching when you have all of this system around being able to purchase a home. Coming out of the New Deal, the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration created a lot of different programs and bureaucracies. Two of those were the FHA, Federal Housing Administration, and the HOLC, the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And it was really to help people purchase homes. Um, they were sort of unattainable coming out of the Great Depression. After the war, most people owned cars. Um, you know, soldiers were coming back, getting married. They didn't want to live in their parents' or grandparents' old houses anymore. Um, suburbs really sprung up for the first time, especially in post-war uh, Johnson County. There was a large influx of, of people coming from Kansas City and buying and building homes here. That regionalism is really um, very tightly ingrained. And so the population starts to go out of that urban core and into um, this new thing really called a suburb. There's this real um, consumerism and American dream. This is a chance for a new generation to have opportunity to have your own backyard, your, you know, your suburban oasis. People wanted these things and the HOLC and the FHA provided that but they were providing it for white families. Very explicitly in their manual, they did not work with African-American families to provide mortgage insurance. So this is a system that's put in place by the federal government to benefit white families in suburban neighborhoods. And so in order to codify neighborhoods to know if they were worthy of getting mortgage insurance, essentially, the HOLC went around with appraisers and figured out what that neighborhood looked like, what the ranking was. Green is the best, brand new houses, all white populations, probably with restrictions on it to make sure it stays white. Red would be a neighborhood that smaller houses, you know, in disrepair, definitely minority populations, African Americans, Jewish families, African American families in Kansas City were probably renting in those red line neighborhoods. They weren't owning their homes. It was difficult to sell. So that wealth wasn't there. That generational building of wealth um, because of owning property and, and owning a home wasn't there. Not everyone who was moving to the suburbs was was racist and doing it for racial reasons, right? Your average person probably didn't understand uh, the ramifications of the FHA and the HOLC. Certainly there were people who did, and certainly there were people who were moving out of the urban core to avoid neighborhoods that were going to uh, have an, a minority encroachment, right, as they were calling it. And some folks are fleeing that because they know that's happening um, and they want something in a community where that won't happen. Deed restrictions had been around for a long time, actually. They're used really in the early 20th century on individual properties to make sure that that particular property stayed in white hands. And there was a real fear about this block busting that a family might sell to an African-American family and then the whole rest of the block would go down the drain, right, was, was sort of the phrase. A lot of the talk at the time is talking about home values and how if a minority population moves into a neighborhood, uh, the home values will plummet. Well, there's really little evidence of that and the FHA didn't ever provide any proof that that was actually happening. And in a lot of ways, uh, today we can look back at the economics and those integrated neighborhoods, actually, the home values stay higher because you have African-American families buying houses. So on the surface of it, it looks like Kansas City and Johnson County is very typical and very average um, and sort of playing along with every other city. But actually, in a lot of ways, Kansas City is leading this suburban trend, right? Because J.C. Nichols is a huge name um, in this in the suburbanization in building large scale neighborhoods and, and marketing them to middle class and upper class families. He takes this thing that's already in place, the racial covenant, the deed restriction, uh, and he says, you know, for a real estate developer that's developing a large neighborhood, that's not good enough we need to do it on the neighborhood level. And so he creates neighborhood associations, homes associations, for his neighborhoods that he's developing. And he says, if you buy here, you have to sign on to all these bylaws that his company's created. And one of those is almost always, no African-American families can own, lease, live, you know, rent this property. And that's why we see a Johnson County that we do today that's still over 80% white. Um, certainly there's more minority populations moving in into Johnson County. There's certainly a larger percentage of African-American families. But these decades of, of restriction and um, undesirable place to live if you're, if you're not white, 
that hangs over, over Johnson County and uh, leaves a legacy in, in many different ways. You know, there's a lot of fighting against these policies up until the 1960s, and eventually that translates in 1968 to the Fair Housing Act, uh, the Civil Rights Act. It calls those deed restrictions unconstitutional. There's probably not as much change as people would like to see, even though the, those things, those deed restrictions are no longer enforced and it's unconstitutional. It takes time for that to change because minority families weren't able for decades to move into those, those neighborhoods. And just because they legally can now, it doesn't mean that they have the means to do so. It doesn't mean they have the uh, desire to do so either. There's a perception that needs to be changed as well um, about how accessible those neighborhoods are. Our mission in public health is to create conditions where everyone can be healthy. So understanding these historical policies is the first step in addressing uh, the disparities that we know exist today. In Johnson County we know that housing costs have outpaced wage growth and this creates an environment where people really cannot afford to live in Johnson County. When people have high housing costs, then they have to stop and think, well, you know, I don't want to get evicted, so I have to pay that, but I may not be able to get groceries this week, or I may not be able to pay my prescription costs and take that medication that's important to my health. So we want to ensure that our policies are inclusive, that we bring people together in the community, we convene groups to discuss the disparities, and, uh, and we get some, some work around uh, what the community needs. We listen to the community, and when we can do that, we can create a safer, healthier, more vibrant community with a high quality of life where everyone can thrive. Good evening. Uh, I'm Alan Katz, the founder of American Public Square at Jewel, and we're delighted for all of you to be here tonight uh, for the panel discussion we're having entitled Erasing Red Lines, Are Our Schools Embracing the Future or Embodying the Past? This program is the culmination of our student programming for this academic year. APS is committed to our mission of improving the tone and quality of public discourse by helping our community meaningfully address society's most perplexing issues. In particular, tonight's program demonstrates our commitment to engage and foster civility amongst our students. And we can best do that through giving them the opportunities to practice and to see models of civility by ourselves. Our student ambassadors, after having spent the fall semester examining what it means to be civil, have spent this semester collaborating on the production of this evening's program. It is one with deep roots in history, as you saw in the, on the, uh, in the uh, saw, saw a few moments ago, stripped from the headlines and surely charged with emotion. Students have met the challenge to convene unlike-minded individuals to have a fact-based conversation over an important and pressing issue. It's now up to us to rise to the occasion and all of us to commit to an evening of civility. To our student ambassadors, we hope this experience has ignited a desire to engage in your communities to burst through your thought silos and deliberate our most pressing issues in order to solve our problems. We, only, we not hope not only to see you at future APS events, but to hear from you as well. And finally, to be here in a room in a public library with parents, teachers, and students is exactly what American Public Square, why we exist. 
I'm going to turn this program now over to Tricia Maxfield, who leads our Civics Education Initiative. Enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Before we begin the conversation in earnest this evening, we want to take a moment to recognize educators everywhere. We know that for the last two years, you have worked under extraordinary and uncertain circumstances. You are often the bridge to students, to parents, to administrators, and to decision makers. Your profession is vital to our future. On that note, I'd like to remind everyone, next week is Teacher Appreciation Week. <laughs> Do what you should. <laughs> Specifically tonight, I want to thank the educators who made this year's student initiative possible. Without their partnership and a lot of effort, the program would not have reached these students, and we would not be gathered here tonight. After I read these names, and I'd love it if you would just give a wave or stand. After I've read the names, let's all acknowledge these teachers and students and educators everywhere with a round of applause. Leah Edens from University Academy. Joni Harrell from Belton High School. Mary, Mary Humphreys from Lee Summit West High School. Joy Jackson from Oak Hill Day School. Mary Murphy from Notre Dame de Sion All Girls High School. And Keith Schoen and Kate Sweeney from Guadalupe Centers High School. Please join me in a round of applause teachers and students everywhere, and I'm now going to turn it over to our student ambassadors. John Stuart Mill is known to have said, he who knows only his own side of the case will know, knows little of that. Bill Nye the Science Guy once said, everyone you will ever meet knows something you don't. As a reminder, during American Public Square programming, we welcome questions and fact checks from the audience. Um, for our audience members in person, you will find a question and fact sheet that are in these little cups around the room. When you have a question or want to fact check something, you can write them down and then hold them up, and one of our students will come around and pick them up and deliver them to our roving reporter or to our fact checker. Um, tonight's roving reporter is Toriano Porter from the Kansas City to our reporting, he's a reporter and part of the editorial board. Um, for those of you watching virtually, please type your questions and fact checks in the chat feature. Tonight's fact, she fact sheet and fact checkers were made possible by William K. Temper Foundation and Dr. Matt Reeves. He's our fact checker for tonight who is being supported by some student volunteers. Several, member of the, I'm sorry, hold on. Several members of the audience have civility bells. These will be rung if the tone of the conversation becomes less than civil. Finally, in the interest of keeping the conversation flowing and, of course, civil, we ask that you not clap during the panel discussion. It is now my privilege to introduce our moderator for the evening, Murray Williams. Thank you, Ashley. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Murray Rose Williams, and I am an editorial writer for the Kansas City Star. And I am really happy to be here. Thank you, American Public Square, for inviting me. It is an honor. So um, I'm going to first get right to it and um, introduce our panel for this evening. Directly to my left here is Jason Roberts. Jason is president of the Kansas City Federation of Teachers and School-Related Personnel, Local 691. Next to Jason is Representative Chuck Basie. Chuck Basie is a Republican representing District 47 and chair of the Elementary and Secondary Education Committee in the Missouri House of Representatives. 
Next to Mr. Basie, we have Kenise Salinas Willick. She is the Executive Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Administration for Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools. And to her left is Mr. Andy Wells. And Mr. Wells is the President of the Missouri Chapter of No Left Turn in Education. And last but not least, we have Dr. Zach Akaji Buston. And um, Dr. Akaji Buston is the Equity and Inclusion Coordinator for the Kansas City, Kansas Public School District. Welcome to each of you, and thank you all for joining us this evening. So I'm going to jump right in. I mean, time is of. Um, is very important, so let's just jump right in with questions here. Um, as you all know, having listened to the introduction, the students involved with American Public Square spent a lot of time um, researching issues in education today. Um, and after doing that, they came away with what they felt was really the most important question to them. And also our American Public Square uh, fact sheet um, for this program outlines the history of education. And that history in Missouri and Kansas shows um, redlining and a series of um, micro school boundary changes that have that impacted or kept Kansas City from having more diverse schools. So these students want to know, here we are 70 years past Brown versus Board of Education or nearly 70 years, and yet in their schools they see students, teachers, administrators who look just like them, a lack of diversity in their schools. Why are our schools today still segregated almost 70 years after Brown v. Board? And um, anybody can jump in here, but I'm going to go to Kenise with this one. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I am so proud of all the students in here, and um, I, I'm just so elated for you all. Um, that's a hard question to answer, um, because I ask that same question every day as well. Um, I, I'm going to speak for myself, and I'm gonna, a lot of this will be for myself, because I feel that I'm in the same position as you in asking the question, but what I find is that minority parents have to go into communities that are different from them to be part of, like they are integrating into their world. It's not the other way around. And so that's my question is why is it not coming from, and if you're okay for me to talk very candidly, I am the DEI person, so I talk very candidly a lot. And so why is it that sometimes Caucasian culture doesn't come in when minority people have to go out? And so I'm gonna ask that to my panel because that's still a question that I have. And for my family, you know, I think minority families want better and what we think is better is in the suburbs. So we go out and we go search. But is that true? Jason, do you have some thoughts on that? Um, is this on? Yes, um, I do. And I think part of it is, you know, we, we return to what we know and we all return to what we're familiar with. And so I was raised in the suburbs and went to suburban schools and went to college and came back. And when I was ready to establish my life, I taught in the inner city. I taught at Central High School uh, right here in Kansas City. And yet where I went to live was not in the city. I went to the suburbs because that's what I grew up with. It's what I was familiar with. And I was kind of raised with this idea that you know, my dream should be a white picket fence and a dog. And so I went to the suburbs and I don't have a white picket fence, but I do have a dog. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I think I went to what was comfortable for me because that's what I grew up with and that's what I knew. Representative Basie, is there some legislative um, involvement in, in, in making a difference here in terms of creating more diverse schools? Well, it, it's a good question. I, I think there could be, but uh, one of the arguments that we hear more than anything else uh, when it 
comes to individual school districts is the importance of local control. So, um, you know, I think it depends on the uh, area you live in and uh, the individual school board, uh, you know, of course, the makeup of the community, uh, everything plays into that. You know, where I'm from, I, I live in the uh, I live in a rural area, but but we live in the Columbia Public School District, one of the larger school districts in in the in the uh, in the state. So when my kids went to school, they went to a rural elementary school, Midway Elementary. My grandkids, a couple of my grandkids, attended there. It's it's mostly white in that school, but then when they transitioned to the middle school to high school. It's, it's totally different, uh, very diverse. Uh, my wife works at one of the larger middle schools in Columbia, and they have a lot of, um, a, a mixture of uh, student population. There's a lot of immigrants there too. So um, it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. So, so. so is the issue more, and uh, are you saying that the issue is more found in the urban areas rather than in the rural area? I, I would think urban so, Urban yeah. and suburban areas where the schools are right. segregated. Yeah, I think that would be much so, so if we have failed and are continuing to fail in um, segreg integrating our schools, then how is it, how do schools bring diversity into, this, into their classrooms? Because it looks like 70 years where we still have segregated schools for the most part, and there has to be a way to diversify the schools. What do we do to, to, to make that happen? Zach? I, I think that question is very difficult to answer. Um, you know, according to the National Center for Education Statistics, 88% of the teacher workforce is white. Now I look out here, this audience is pretty diverse. So if our teaching workforce is predominantly white, as a student who is of Asian descent, of a black student, a Hispanic student, where's your representation in that? And where's your champion in that to say, I want to aspire to do that. So if our teacher workforce is predominantly white, to get diversity into the schools as, and as, as well as into the teaching workforce, I think that also needs to be addressed, is how do we get a diversified workforce of teachers who then become administrators, who then become district administrators, to then be representation and champions for our students. Well, that brings me right up to the next question, and that is there has been a movement to bring diversity into the schools. It's called diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Training teachers to, um, to bring diversity, equity, in, and inclusion into the classroom, having um, administrators to do a better job of hiring more diverse, uh, more diverse staff. However, there also seems to be some pushback today against diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and so, you know, why is that? Why is that happening and where is that coming from? Um, I think that some parents have, you know, pushed back against that. You hear that in school board meetings um, and our legislators have pushed back against that. Where is that coming from? Andy, can you touch that one, please? I'd be glad to. <laughs> That's part of what No Left Turn Education does. A lot of it comes from at least for myself and a lot of the parents out there, they don't believe that seeing race in school or teaching a racial concept or through a lens of race should be happening. Because all children should be treated the same. There should not be a difference. As soon as we start segregating children by race, now we're being the racist. If we are dividing and calling children out based on race, based on the national origin they're from, or whatever else, now we're segregating them. We're doing it. That's why I have a real problem with DEI, because I don't believe that we should be segregating children out. We shouldn't be. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't teach African American history. Absolutely, we should. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be teaching our worst parts of our past in history. But 
I think the, the country was moving in the right direction for several years. It took a long time, but we were moving in the right direction of we were starting to get away from judging people based on their race in any shape, form, or fashion. It's the content of the person, right? I, I, I want to I say something to that point, and, and I, I somewhat agree with what you're saying. I'm going to go back to my last statistic of 88% of our teacher workforce is white. In Missouri, in the state of Missouri, black students lose 162 more days of school due to out-of-school suspensions than white students do. So, how, so if our teacher's force is white and our students are black and, 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 and mixed, Where's that disconnect in saying, I'm going to suspend you because I don't like this, I don't like this, I, I don't like this. I, I, I want to let you respond to that, but I do want to come back with what he just said, Jason. I mean, you are, a, you know, you have been a teacher in the classroom. Why does that happen? What is, what is he talking about? I think there, I will speak from my experience. Being raised in the suburb, I remember the first day that I arrived at Central thinking, my God, this school is loud. And as I worked there, I came to love it. Um, but, but it took time. And so I think that we have to be careful not to bring our middle class suburban values into the urban core and into these classrooms. And sometimes that takes on-the-job training and experience. There is no textbook that any college could possibly give you to break down what you have always known. But what you can do is you can walk through those doors and you can encounter those students and you can love them like they are your own. And that will take some time. But, but you bring your middle class values to the urban core from suburbia and then at, at night you go back to suburbia, you, you're a little jaded. Kenisa, I want to ask you something based on what um, Mr. Wells was saying. Give us a little bit more of a definition of what diversity, equity, and inclusion actually is, because he was talking about, you know, segregating our students out um, and, and that he was opposed to that. Zach seems to agree with some portions of what he said. Can you give us a better definition of what diversity, equity, and inclusion is? Yeah, I would have to say that. Um I'm trying to take what Mr. Wells is saying and trying to put it in some context. Um, I want to say diversity, equity, inclusion is not just about race. Um, we just keep wanting to talk about it as a racial issue, and it's not. Um, everybody up here is part of diversity. We're diversified in our age. We're diversified in our identity of what we identify with. We um, are diverse with our race, that is what we can see, but we're also diverse in our religion and other factors. If you go into school thinking that we're all the same, you're losing out on the beauty of each person sitting in this room. And so the reason that diversity, equity, and inclusion was even brought to the forefront because voices were not being heard. It's not equitable in how we are teaching, and we are only hearing one person's side of history and only one story. And so the reason that we have diversity, equity, and inclusion is to bring everyone's voice to the table. The inclusionary piece is when you get to the table, is your voice actually heard? And so, and is it valued? And so in, if you say that it's not that everyone should be treated the same there's no way we don't treat our kids the same so but then on in the background of that is what are you bringing to the table that is going to enrich this environment zach zach i want to ask you something diversity equity and inclusion we seem to think that just just fell from the sky somewhere that just popped up all of a sudden that's not it's not a new concept can you Talk to us a little bit about, about that. Sure, let, let me flip through some of my, my notes. Um, this concept of DEI, you know, if, if you look back to court cases, uh, you have Brown versus the board. But one thing that I want to pull out was in Tinker versus Des Moines, um, and in Tinker versus Des Moines, it was a lot about free speech and a lot about 
um, expressing yourselves. And in this docket, um, they quoted another court case, Shelton versus Tucker. And in that, they stated, and sorry, court, uh, Tinker versus Des Moines happened in 1969 when that court case was passed or was voted upon. The classroom is particularly the marketplace of ideas. The nation's future depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to that robust exchange of ideas which discover truth out of multiple tongues. So if the high court can have this in document of diversity, of multiple tongues, and, and be saying this is part of this case, in 1969, why are we still there? Good question. Um, do we have some questions from the audience? Okay, Toriano. Good evening. I'm Toriano Porter, your roving reporter for tonight. I have a question. Even wants to know, I understand diversity and how important it is. I'm wondering what happens on a daily basis inside the classroom. Shouldn't we start there too? Feel free to join uh, or answer the question, please. And say that one more time. I understand how important diversity is. I'm wondering what happens on a daily basis inside the classroom. So um, it depends, right? So I'm gonna, I, I, I know most of your schools. Um, I know Lee Summit West, I know, I know some of your schools. I'm not sure what's happening in particular, what, what happens day to day, but I know what's missing. And I know what's missing is multiple voices. Because I'm listening to what Zach is saying, and if your teacher's stories are the only stories that you hear, what's missing? If your teacher's experiences, and we don't have a multi-generation or multi-ethnic group of teachers whose stories are being told. So I can't say exactly what's happening, but I can tell you what's missing, and it's a multi-ethnic voice to give multiple stories. So with that said, I, I wanna go back to Andy for a second and ask you, after, after hearing what um, Kanisa has said and what Zachary has said, have, do you have any different thoughts about what diversity and e equity and inclusion is and how it impacts students in the classroom? Or do we need to, to, to push further? Diversity and inclusion, I don't have as much problem with it, and I can understand the concept, absolutely. Equity, for me personally, just we should not have equity, we should have equality. Equity is equal outcome. And the only way to get equal outcome is you have to, you either have to bring people up to a level or bring people down to a level. Now, I understand with like suspensions and, and out of school, and the, that's why critical race theory is in the legal system because in the legal system we want people to have the same punishment for the same crime okay somebody commits a crime it should not matter the color of their skin it shouldn't matter anything else. they should have the same punishment I'm absolutely for critical race theory being studied in law school and trying to make it equitable in the outcome of the person here's the problem in the classroom though if you have a student with 100 IQ, you have a student with 150 IQ, that student with 100 IQ can only perform up to a certain level. That's, not, that's nothing about race, it's nothing about national origin, that's just how they were made. They only have a certain potential. That student with 150 IQ should be able to just pretty much sit there and do almost nothing and perform to that same top level of the 100 IQ student. That's the way our brains work. So the only way for that child who should be in advanced classes or gifted classes, it, they can't put that child in those gifted classes because then the outcomes are not equitable. They don't have 
equal outcomes in the end, which is the goal of equity. Equity in education to me makes no sense. I don't think that, I think that you're talking about um, outcomes. Um, that's, but, that's not what equity means. They're talking about Desi's, equity going Des, into. But Desi's, Desi's definition is equitable outcomes. That's in Desi's own. So our Department of Elementary and Secondary Education says equity is equitable outcomes. Let's, let's go to um, Representative Basie on that. Um, Talk to us a little bit about yeah, what I, I kind of agree with what Andy said initially about uh, the three terms. There's really, from the people I hear, um, uh, you know, on a regular basis, uh, really don't have any problems with uh, the diversity and inclusion. I think we all kind of agree that that we need to uphold those uh, those traits. Um, equity is the problem. I mean, I wish we could call it equality, uh, kind of what he said. But you know, if I could kind of deviate just a little bit sure. you know when when i was uh 17 years old I, dro I dropped out of high school and i entered the military and the military was was very diverse i mean there was there was we had immigrants we, in my boot camp platoon we had a guy from panama so uh, it, and it left the military in 1980 and became employed by the federal government again a very diverse workforce and very inclusive and uh so you know, I, in my experience, my life experience, um, this really wasn't a, an issue at all, but maybe in our educational efforts, maybe we should look at this a little closer. I think we have some questions coming from the audience. Toriano? Yes. This one here is a statement. Fat checker, Mac, I need you on this, all right? Make sure it's okay. This comes from Victoria. Equity is giving everyone mm, what they need to succeed. Equality is giving everyone this, what is handwriting, the same. Yeah. <laughs> and equality. Yes, I know, that, I know what she was saying. So equity is giving everyone what they need. Equality is giving everyone the same. So thinking about that, Equity is what each person is needing. So people can need different things. Students may need different ways to learn. To, students may need different resources to get them to the same place. Equality is just handing out all the same tools, but I might not need that tool to get to the place I need to succeed. And, and, and you know, to, to that point, there is substantial amount of research that state there is no one size fit education system. That's why it's equity. But then again, why are school districts having to submit an equity report that compares the lowest scoring student in the class to the highest scoring student in the class and that they get scored better the closer those numbers come together? Again, we're trying to You're make leveling. an equal we're trying to make an equal outcome, and in education, you cannot make an equal outcome. No two people learn the same. Absolutely. Everybody has a different ability, everybody has a different way to learn, and you cannot have an equal outcome, which is what DESE, our Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, says equity is. More questions? <laughs> Toriana, do we have another question? Absolutely. Okay, let's go for that. For any of you, what can school districts do to teach incoming teachers about DEI and understanding that they're diverse students and their backgrounds. Jason, can you take that one? I think I would like to focus, we can focus on the, the school district that is doing the hiring, but I'd like to focus too on the post-secondary opportunities, so the colleges. Why is it that all of our colleges stick you in the suburbs to do your student teaching? Why don't, why don't they give you the opportunity to do your student teaching in the urban areas? And then you encounter people that are a little different than you. And, and you put some tools in your toolbox for this diversity and, and inclusion. And then if you get hired in the suburbs, so be it. But why is it that we're sticking folk in the suburbs and we're not giving them the training in the urban core to encounter those diverse students. And I think we have a real, a real failure in the state of Missouri in our uh, college preparatory and, and our teacher preparatory uh, programs by just sticking people in the easier places to learn how to do your job. And I put easier in quotes. 
Well, when you look at that, I'm going to go back. Sorry, Kunis. I'm oh, go going ahead. to go back to my 88% number. If those teachers are then going to matriculate into administration, those this pool comes smaller. Those administrators go to district administrators, that pool becomes even smaller, and there's still not very much diversity within district leaders. Who's our professors? Who's out of, a lot of our professors in education programs come from district administrative positions. So if our district administrative positions are not very diverse, that, that representation is not getting to the university level. Yeah, and I would have to go even further than that. Why is diversity, equity, and inclusion not embedded in every course at the post-secondary level? Because if you're out here teaching all kids, then we should have diversity, equity, and inclusion embedded in all content areas. Well, there's this, there is pushback um, and several bills in the, in the legislature that deal with equity, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but those bills that do deal with that are training for teachers in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those bills say, no, we don't want diversity, equity, and inclusion training for, um, for our teachers. But that is contrary to what the students are, seem to be asking for and, and, and what you're saying. Representative Basie, am I wrong on that or am I right? The bills are opposed to diversity, equity, and inclusion training, yes? Well, yeah, I mean, you have to look at you know, each bill individually. And they go through a, a serious vetting process. So it, you know, each, each bill has to have a hearing. Um, they, they have, there's uh, the ability to amend the bill as it goes through the process by anybody on the committee. Um, if they make it out of the committee process, they go to a second committee. This is on the House side. Then uh, if they make it out of the Rules Committee, it goes to the, what they call the bill calendar. Then it's up to the floor leader to bring them up for debate on the floor. And when you, if you get a bill in front of the body, uh, it's still open for more amendments. And if you get it through the House, it goes to the Senate and it goes through the same process All civility included here. But do any of those bills Propose to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Um, there or? could be. I'd, I'd need to know a specific bill, okay. and, and uh, you know, if I had known some of this, I could have brought some examples. Do you have another question, me. Toriano? Please yes, ask. Yes, absolutely. That. This is a great question. Kia wants to know if we should indeed teach black, uh, teach black history, and uh, the worst part of our country. Why have we not included the history of LGBTQ? That is a fantastic question. And when we talk about diversity, let's, just talk, let's not just talk about race and religion, which is what we like to talk about from a Judeo-Christian lens, but let's talk about our students in our classrooms who are LGBT, who hear that they are not equal and are not allowed to participate in particular events or that they should be treated differently. I think we've got a real problem coming up, and I think that this next generation of people are going to be the very people that are going to undo all of this mess that we're seeing in this country. Okay. Yes. With that, my question, if 5.6% of the population of the United States identify, self-identify as LGBTQ, 5.6% of the population, then why did the latest Gallup poll of, of 13 to 17-year-olds is almost 25% identify as LGBTQ, okay? I, I don't want to get into this debate, but since we went there, uh, <laughs> why is, where are the students getting the idea? I know my 12-year-old daughter came home and said, hey, Dad, kids keep calling me a lesbian because I got short hair and because I like to play sports, so, I'm just going to start telling everybody I'm a lesbian. What? And why? And the other thing, and it was actually one of the uh, one of the House, Repre House of Representatives um, in the legislature said that he knew at five years old he was part of the LGBTQ community. He knew he was gay at five. Okay. If every person that I've talked with personally, my friends that I, a couple of them I'm extremely close with, good friends of mine, are part of the LGBTQ community. Nobody ever had to talk to them or explain to them or convince them or have classes celebrating it 
for them to know what they were. I understand not, that. So are, are you saying that those are the reasons that, that we're seeing so much pushback? We're seeing pushback because yeah. parents are, why is it being forced into our school districts? Why, why is, and especially if you want to talk sports, a biological male competing in female sports, most parents, and I guarantee you if it was a ballot measure in the state of Missouri, it would overwhelmingly win that to not have bio, people that were born biological male in girls' sports, even if they started transitioning. I, I think Zachary be, has a response to that. There, there are two court cases um, that talk to this issue. The first is Boystock versus the Clay County, um, recent 2020, where the court decided um, on issues of transgenderness. Um, the second court case was Gloucester County versus the school board. Uh, of the school board versus Gravingham 2001, which did not go to the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court ruled um, in favor of the Fourth Circuit, stating that that person was entitled to her identity. I want to reference a Title IX statement that came out in 2015 um, that talks to this. The department's Title IX regulations permit schools to provide sex segregation, restrooms, locker rooms, shower facilities, housing, athletics, uh, and single sex classrooms under certain circumstance. When a school elects to separate or treat students differently based on the basis of sex, those schools generally must treat transgender students consistent with their gender identity. So directly out of the Office of Civil Rights from Title IX, this came out in 2015, that schools generally must treat them by the basis of their identity, not necessarily by the basis of their biological gender. Can, can I respond to, he, he, he made the comment about uh, the number, uh, the percentage of the population among young people is in, increasing. And I would say, what if it's not? What if the actual population in the United States is somewhere in the 20s, but we're finally in a place where people feel comfortable admitting to who they are and not hiding, not going and getting married or going into a profession where they're required to be single so that they can hide who they are. They actually feel like we're in a place in this country where I can say this is what I am and I stand firm in that. Alfred Kinsey said in the 40s that the population was in the 20s. So what you're saying is that the, it has always been this, but they have been in the closet. Correct. If you will. Yes. Toriano, do we have another question? Yes, yeah, so this, this question is about teacher diversity in the classroom. Like you guys mentioned up here, 88% of teachers are white. Uh, one student wants to know, one person wants to know, um, when there, I want to ask about teacher diversity. When there is a school filled with black students and only white teachers, is that setting those students up for failure in the real world? Absolutely not. Um, I, I would not say that. I think that we have to take a little bit more time in training and understanding and educating. I think everyone can, has the opportunity to be a great teacher. It's the time that that teacher will take in understanding where they are. So if you're teaching in the urban core, learn the urban core. Learn the kids, understand where you're at, who are you serving, whose voices are in the room. Just like if you were in a suburban classroom and I'm a minority, I have to know where I'm at. But learn the kids, learn where you are and the training and the understanding and the professional development. I, my kids had some great teachers and they weren't African American, Hispanic, but they were great people and they wanted to learn. So no, we're not, this is not cancel culture. I don't think we should cancel out every teacher. Um, what we need to do is promote education and get more minority people to want to come into education, but it just doesn't look enticing because minority people can go elsewhere and make more money. Another question, Toriana? Yeah, this is, this, this is yes. a follow-up question that leads right into that. Would, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, would more equality and equity possibly influence more diversity inside the school building? Absolutely. 
Yes. And I think if you brought that more into the schools, more minority teachers would come because they would, be, they would feel safe. I'm not sure if minority teachers feel like the education space is safe space. And so I think that would, be, if we had more education, I think more people would come to the education system. I will, I will piggyback off of that and say, I think that's important, but I think there's another issue that's important. And that is the affordability of college. College is so expensive that people who may come from the suburbs are more likely to get loans to go to school that you're not gonna be granted if you come from the urban core. Right. So who are we denying the college education to become the teacher to teach in the urban core? Right. The but the very people from there. I would have there. to say that's education as well because people coming from minority um, backgrounds can get scholarships and grants, but they're not taught how to get them. That's it's a right. paperwork, right. it's a paperwork and, hoop jump. Yeah. That I'm come from a diverse, would, would that come from having a more diverse um, faculty in the school To teach schools. you how to navigate the system. But, but here's another problem with that, and exactly what you're saying with the lack of, the, the high cost of education, but you also, our state, our school districts, our school districts are failing they're teaching staff by the salaries that they're giving them. The school districts are absolutely failing. They need to find places to cut within their budget to give teacher pay raises. And here's why. The average salary for a Missouri teacher, starting salary, I believe is about 36, 36 38,000 a year. A full-time worker at McDonald's making $15 an hour is making 30,000 a year. Why in the world would you accrue all of that massive debt by going to a university for a job that's only going to pay you $6,000 a year more? It's, it doesn't make sense. Can we get a fact check on the salaries? Is, and just to make sure we're getting that right, so we're getting good information out. I just read it the other day. I also wanted to go to Representative Basie on that. Um, I mean, you talk about teacher pay. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting because uh, this has come up this year. The governor's proposed budget had uh, um, a uh, request in there to have teachers starting pay at $38,000 a year. There was a lot of pushback on that. Um, it didn't make it through the House Budget Committee. I don't know if the Senate changed that or not, but, but interestingly, there's been a couple bills filed relative to teachers' pay. And you know who's opposing that? The Missouri Association of School Administrators because the smaller districts are afraid they're not going to be able to, to afford that. But, but that, 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 that was, I thought where, that was very that's, interesting. That's where those small districts with a thousand population, thousand kids in their school district from K through 12, they have to be able to manage their budget. If they can't manage their budget to be able to give that increase, because the majority of the education money does not come from the state, the majority of the education money comes from your local tax dollars. And if the school district is not, or they are not good stewards and able to prioritize, because who's educating all of the young people I see out here? The people educating you deserve a heck of a lot more than what they're being paid in this state. So Absolutely. Can, so can I ask, is that equity or equality? <laughs> that would <laughs> no and i will absolutely answer we are talking about adults and professionals and they should be getting equal pay for their work and that is equity that is i, and but that, but I, I, I think that's very that different. but i agree i agree with equity that's what happens and legal in the system. classroom I, no it is not okay that i, I, I okay. think that's very difficult because okay. you also have to look at the mill levies of these smaller rural counties this is true too right Absolutely. Well, look at Kansas Jason. City. Right. Kansas City hasn't passed a, a bond increase for its schools since 1967. Yes, this is true. That is absolutely true. Yes. Toriano, I think we do have another question. More of a comment, but okay. I think it's a powerful comment. Guys. Okay, uh, let's hear this it. This is really good. Actually, before I get to the comment, there's a question from Mr. Wells. Why can't we teach students the history of discrimination against the LGBT community, such as the Stonewall riots or Compton's cafeteria riots? What is the issue teaching past history of the LGBT community? I never said I have a problem with teaching accurate history. True, factual, accurate history, I am absolutely all for, whether whatever history it is, as long as it's factual, 
provable history, great, teach it. I have a problem, I, what I do have a problem with is when people say that they want to teach their truth. I'm sorry, but my truth is different than everybody's truth on this panel because I have a different lived experience. So how I teach something or what I believe, especially if I put my personal spin on what's being taught in the classroom. When I, I taught in the military, I tried to not teach with a personal background and I taught people of every race, color, sexual orientation and it didn't bother me one bit. I, I never had an issue. I don't think that's what's happening. I mean the bills that we have right now in the legislature, actually I think the language is something like there it prohibits the teaching of any one people who oppressing any other group of people. So in other words, you could not teach um, any history that involves the a particular group oppressing another group, which would mean that you could not, if you can't teach that, you could not teach about slavery because, of course, that is one group oppressing another. You could not teach about women's suffrage because that's one group oppressing another. You could not teach about civil rights because you'd have to teach about slavery and Jim Crow. So, I mean, and I think that's, that's what people are, are a little confused about is how do you teach these things if bills like that do pass through the legislature? And I, I wanna ask you, um, Representative Basie, do you have a comment on that? What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, it goes back to the, the vetting process. These bills are, they're, they're kind of stalled out right now. I think the Senate is going to, as we talked in the back room, the Senate's going to pick up uh, House Bill 1858, which is a parental bill of rights, but it, it's going to have stuff added to it. So we're going to have to see what the, the product is and see where we go forward. So I, I wish I had of, number one, I, I feel like I'm missing a significant piece of equipment. I left my cell phone in my car. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people can relate on that. But, you know, I could look up these bills and, and, and get the specifics on them because they're all different. So um, we'll just have to see what, what happens. And if, if, if there's a good, good chance they might not even pass. Right. So. Let, let's go to our fact checker. Is that what, we, is that what we've got here? Yeah. Yes. So we've got a few uh, fact checks. And with a lot of these, it'll be uh, definitions that are in contested usage. So certain organizations see certain things differently. Um, the Department of uh, Secondary Education uh, talks about equity. And they have, a, oh, it looks like about a 30-word definition. But it focuses on each student, uh, particularly those from underrepresented, underserved, and marginalizing group, marginalized groups uh, excelling through purposeful engagement, rigorous instruction, and relevant educational experiences. Um, but essentially, the advocates for equity are saying that uh, an equal response is not always a fair and just response. And then I think critics of equity are making the claim that equity is about, uh, you know, uh, as I think Mr. Williams has said, uh, uh, forcing folks into a, a difference of outcomes. Um, there was a discussion earlier about the percentages of educators uh, in the nation uh, who are people of color versus uh, different demographic groups. And we thought it'd be helpful for the purposes of our discussion here in Kansas City. In 2018, uh, the stats on all public uh, educators uh, were that it was 61% white, 31% black, 5% Hispanic, 2% Asian, and 1% other. Um, so that's in the Kansas City Public School District in 2018. Uh, finally, discussion about, and just keeping a rolling list here of uh, things we've talked about, uh, people reporting being LGBTQ. Um, there is a a uh, bit from the CDC, they do a youth risk behavior surveillance uh, survey, and in 2019, which is the most recent numbers that we could locate, 84% uh, of high school students surveyed reported being heterosexual, 2.5% uh, reported being gay or lesbian, 8.7% reported being bisexual, and 4.5% reported uh, not sure. And then to the question about uh, whether or not these figures that we're reporting reflect changes 
changes in uh, culture and openness to this. Uh, Gallup did surveys uh, that reported about 7% of the population uh, saying that they were LGBTQ and that that is up double from 10 years ago. And so the same survey uh, is reporting twice as many people uh, stating that they have those positions or that they have that orientation compared with a decade ago. Presumably that uh, suggests that there are more folks who are uh, saying that now in surveys. Uh, it seems more likely than uh, them deciding <laughs> that they uh, were, were wrong 10 years ago or, or had a different view 10 years ago. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, also, uh, the starting salaries are roughly accurate. So depending on how you parse it and which school district. So starting salaries for educators uh, in Columbia, uh, salary for a first year educator with a bachelor's degree is 39,000. Uh, it's 41, basically 42 if you have a master's degree. Uh, but of course that varies, as you mentioned, with the different mill levies. Mill levies. Um, so Marceline was one of the lower districts at $31,000, um, so comparable to or lower than a $15 an hour wage. Thank you very much. We are getting, we're getting close to time, but I do want to get some more questions from the audience in here. Um, and so Toriano, if you have more questions, I would like to get those asked absolutely, too. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Let's give Fat Checker May and his team a, a yeah, round of applause. Yeah, absolutely. Guys. So this is the comment that I wanted to make from the audience, then I'll, I'll get to that question, okay? Um, as a lesbian myself, when it comes to a school community, you can um, encounter a lot of homophobia. It may be through stereotyping jokes or just flat out uh, what people say. Seeing representation in school via teachers, friends, or what have you can make a lot of students feel seen and safe in their environment. That's a comment from an audience member. Thank you for being brave enough to share that. Okay, back to the classroom. This is a great question. Great question. How do you know, any of you, how do you know what kids are experiencing today? How much time do you use panelists spend in the classroom? What about school boards? Should classroom experience be required to be on the school board? I just wanna, I wanna piggyback on that question because I wanna add to that because it was one of the questions I had, is are, how much are students being allowed to be involved in the decision making process? So we have legislators making decisions, we have administrators making decisions, but has anybody asked the students, where is the student voice in all of this? If a student cannot buy a pack of cigarettes until they're 18. They can't join the military until they're 18 with, without parental signature. They can't buy a pistol until they're 20, 21. They can't buy alcohol until they're, or pistols 25, alcohol's 21. There's a reason why those age limits are there is, and no offense to the young people in the room, but you're still learning and growing. You're not ready to make the decisions about what you should be learning. Okay, I, I, wanna, I wanna say this. Hmm. So, and let me interject. <laughs> not ready. <laughs> they may not, it, not all students may be prepared to make their decisions, but my question is not that the student should make the decision, but is their voice even being considered in the decision-making process? So are students being brought to the table and being allowed to talk about what they know and what they're experiencing? That's the, I think that's the question. Where's the student voice in all of this? Yeah. Kines? As, as an educator for 20 plus years, um, a three-year-old can tell you and teach you something. Um, and so um, student voice is huge. Um, I have been in every sector of education. I've been a teacher, a counselor, an administrator at the high school and the elementary level, and now I'm in DEI. With all the levels of what I have uh, learned, um, I learn most from kids. Um, in my position now, I have reach, I have um, somewhat of a power, and now it's my turn to show staff and the community that kids have a voice. So what I have done with my team is that I bring students uh, to the table and we had a, a summit with Kenyan governors um, from Kenya and they did a whole week of 
um, conversation, debate around business and education, um, anywhere from uh, women's rights, and they still are in contact with the governors of Kenya. So that's just a little bit. We're okay. having a conference um, that are going to talk about kids, and so what from my lens that kids are the heartbeat of America they are what we are you know we want them to be better how can they be better if they don't have dialogue like this in the classroom do the legislators hear from students yeah we sure do um, uh, you know the classrooms come down there all the time um, but but um, you know, I, I don't uh, I don't have a history or a, a background in education, but um, my wife works for the Columbia Public School District, so um, uh, I do visit schools on occasion. Of course, COVID kind of shut that down. We're really not allowed to go in uh, freely anymore in the Columbia schools, but uh, uh, it is important for for children, uh, students to engage, and I would certainly encourage that to be the case. I I, I want to piggyback on that. Um, Re Representative yes, Basie, <laughs> you were time. you finished college in 1991. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I would assume in May. No, in December. December. Yes. Okay. I was before born August of 91. So my generation is totally different than yours. In the audience, how many of you were born after 2001? Okay. A large so, portion of the audience. So yes. in my adolescence, I w I w in my adolescence, I've witnessed two major events. One happened in 99, which was Columbine. The second happened in 2001, not September 11th. In their lifetime, right now, in their adolescence, they witnessed the first black president. They witnessed the first female vice president. They witnessed the first female, black female judge on the high court, but they've also experienced tragedy. Highest rate of school shootings, um, COVID-19. So their view on life is totally different than all of ours. And how can we say we are gonna impose all of these legislations and laws and whatnot without hearing their on voice. that on that note um we're running out of time very quickly here but, and i just want to make sure that we are really addressing the audience is there anything else that you want to say yes another question to one Rihanna, more question please. from the audience this is a great one again from olivia i understand that lgbt uh, lgbtq community should be treated the same but what about when a non-LGBTQ student has an issue with someone in that community, but it's uh, treated very differently. So that we're talking about equal treatment? treatment. Equal treatment. Um, and uh, that community being the schools. I mean, is that happening? It does. Yes. Yes. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's happening in little, small, rural, 1,000 population student schools that their kids are being harassed because of their gender identity, their sexual orientation, it is absolutely happening. And I absolutely disagree with that, that you should not be judging some, that's what I wanna get back. I'm all about not judging people based on their gender or their sexual orientation. So should we be creating spaces in schools where students and teachers can build bonds and trust so that students can talk to their uh, their teachers about such issues as that can no. so absolutely no it is education <laughs> absolutely no it's parents job yes what but do you do if you're an lgbt student who you feel that your parents want to throw you out of the house you've got nobody to talk to what if what if you come from some religious fundamental home where you feel like you legitimately may be ostracized and homeless and the one person you feel comfortable talking to is that teacher yeah what's wrong with that what happens then the teacher okay the teacher's job is to teach our schools are failing our students in 
arithmetic, in ELA, in science, in history. Our schools are not getting better every year. They're getting worse every year. Our grades across the state of Missouri are consistently going down, not up. The more that we concentrate on somebody's, we want to have a, oh, I'm going to have a relationship, and I'm going to have, we're going to talk about this issue, we're going to talk about that issue, because your parents want to. Not to say that there shouldn't be a counselor the student should talk to, but I don't want that teacher being the counselor. That teacher needs to be teaching arithmetic. They need to be teaching science and math. That's why we have counselors in schools. I, I will just <laughs> and jump in there and just say, if, you, if a student does not feel like they have someone to talk to, if they cannot express themselves, if they cannot to clear their mind and their hearts of whatever issue is ailing them, they won't learn. And that's why we have counselors in schools. We have counselors. But to why can't counsel a teacher be a counselor on their plan time? Because they are not a trained counselor. They do not have the certifications. They are not counselors. But it doesn't. It doesn't teachers. take a counselor to value every student in that class. I didn't say you don't have to value the student. I'm saying I don't. Your job should be educating the student on the subject that you're supposed to be educating them on. My job is to love those children that walk through my door and to show them compassion. Your that job is, is my to, job. No, your job is to teach the okay, students. Okay, we're getting very passionate here. Your job is to <laughs> teach the students. We are getting very passionate, and I do think we have some fact checks. That's right, we have one more fact check. I'd like to thank Shakira for being a part of this. I'll read the uh, question from the audience, and then she'll provide the fact check that she researched. Um, Transgender and non-binary youth are already at higher risk for poor mental health and suicide due to bullying, discrimination, and rejection. I feel that the misguided legislation will only make matters worse, and the fact check found. 48% of this group non-gender and transgender individuals said that in the last 12 months they engaged in self-harms. 40% of those surveyed reported having seriously considered attempting suicide. Is that it? I think we are um, about to wrap up here, but I have one more thing that, oh, you do have another question, don't you? Okay, can we, can, can we, sneak, can we sneak that one in really quickly? Hey, listen, it's all about the kids out here. Yes, kids. I know, they're great. So listen, this is what the, the folks are talking about out in the audience. Right? We, why are we able to get taxed at 16 and acquire a job, but we can't get the representation? Isn't that, that what we fought against in the beginning <laughs> against England? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, who wants to take on that one? Representative Basie, can you take on that? We're talking about taxes. Well, as a fan of uh, low taxes, um, <laughs> it, it's a good point. But, you know, uh, when, when you work, you know, your uh, employers, most of them are required to uh, take out the appropriate amount of taxes. So, Does a student have a point, though, if they pay taxes? Shouldn't they have a say? Uh, when they're the appropriate age, yeah. Well, what is the appropriate age? Um, they can vote when they're 18. They can vote when they're 18. And can they run for office when they're 18? No, they cannot. So Who makes those laws? Well, it depends on what office. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, so if, if students have a voice and they have something that they want to say, how do they do that? You know, obviously these students are, um, definitely have um, strong voice and are paying attention to what's happening um, in, in our state as far as the legislature and what's happening with education. What do they do? Yeah, all, all, I'm not going to joke about this. I probably shouldn't because it was a... Uh, it was a legitimate question. Um, anyone in this room, no matter what your age uh, is, you have the ability to communicate with your elected officials, whether it's the uh, school board, the city council, the mayor, legislators like myself, uh, the governor. Um, send us an email, call their office. Um, can't say you're gonna get an answer. You might not get the answer you want, but um, I do try and answer um, as many emails as possible. You can't get to all of them, of course. But, what about phone but calls? Phone calls, phone calls emails? Yeah, and visits. You can come visit uh, the Capitol. It's your Capitol. Um, come to the Capitol, visit us. Uh, but will they be heard? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been in enough committee hearings, and not just education co committee, but I've been in committee hearings throughout the, this session for different reasons. 
and there have been multiple students come up there, young 12-year-olds coming up with their parents and testifying. And let me tell you what, it, make, it does make a difference. If you have a legitimate concern, if you have a legitimate something to say about a piece of legislation, come make your, go make your voice heard. I shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be just the adults up there making our voices heard at the House or at, at, you know, in legislation with our elected officials. You guys got to get involved, and you can't just get involved by complaining about it on social media or complaining about it in the classroom. If you want to get involved, actually get out there and get involved. Please. We've, we've talked about a lot of issues tonight, um, and um, we've... I don't know if those are the most important issues facing education today. There may be more important issues. We did talk a little bit about teacher pay, but there's also access. There's mental health issues. There are so many other issues in education. And I do wonder sometimes if we're focusing on the wrong thing by only talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and parental rights, are we missing something? But let me just throw out, we have a few moments. Please keep your responses quick and short. Now that we've talked about so many of these issues, what do we do about them? So what, now what? What do we do about this? Jump in. Well, events like this is a good start. I mean, just uh, communicating. Um, I, I think learning is a continual process. I, I learn stuff all the time. But um, it, it's a very good question, but... Um, uh, we're, uh, we should continue to try and improve at, at anything you're doing. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't have the, an all the answers uh, naturally, but yeah. Zach. Sure. I, I, I want to direct this to our students. Um, I was listening to a podcast and, and heard this the other day. If you are the smartest person in the room, you are in the wrong room. Keep growing, keep challenging the status quo, keep fighting for what is right and just, and be a megaphone and amplify them into the earthquakes that they are. I just wanna say that everybody in here is beautiful. I want you to embrace your beauty. If you are in a predominantly white school, go to a predominantly black school, learn from them, cross the lines, do not stay in this segregated place that we live in and go and learn from each other. Continue to write history, continue your own history, and today is history. If we timestamp this and put it in a book, this is history and this is beautiful. Andy, what do you say? I'm gonna go back to where we originally started this and I was actually thinking about this um, just talking with my mother who's here with me, drove up with me. When I was in Africa, one of the things, I spent about nine years working in Africa as a government, US government contractor hunting terrorists. Um, one of the things that I noticed that really kind of stood out to me is in Niami, Niger, the country of Niger, mm -hmm. the capital city, Niami, if you look at where the people lived in the city, they all lived in areas associated with their tribes. Very rarely did you see people living in a different area that wasn't part of their tribal background. That country has existed for a long time. All of these people are definitely African. They're all black. I was normally the only white guy whenever I was on Whenever I was working with the military, I was the, I was the only white dude. So what I'm saying is, I guess what that gets to is, we get comfortable with who we're around, which is one of the problems with the redlining in districts and why it's gonna be so hard. Until we can get comfortable being around people that we maybe don't like their music or we don't like their culture or we're not used to the, whatever the reason being until we can get comfortable enough to step out of that and cross those lines as you said we're going to stay segregated why are why do we still have so many people in small pockets together because they have the choice to move they have the choice to go someplace else they do 
Okay. We, as Americans, we got a choice. Yeah. That, that was the difference with, and I think Representative Basie and myself both share that. In the military, we volunteered, and we didn't have a choice. You got Your roommate was whoever your roommate was, and that's it. Have a nice day. You might hate each other. You might not like it. You have nothing in common. You're stuck with each other. But the military as a culture, you as you spent time in the military, you got used. You get, got that I, very I'm diverse gonna have to, I'm going to have to cut you off because we will still no, want to get Jason in here to have his last word in here. So, and I apologize for having to cut you off, Andy. It's okay. I'll keep talking. <laughs> Jason, I do want to hear from I'm, you. I'm going to break it up into the actual question. So what? I'm going to quote the great philosopher Whitney Houston, who said, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Now what? Let's get back into this country into a place where teachers are respected, not vilified by legislation, and we will see the future, our children, go into the profession and fix the problems. I think that was a great wrap up. What so, do you guys think? So all think? of you got a challenge. That's just awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. So good evening. My name is Denisha Snell. I'm the director of programs here for American Public Square at Jewel. Yay. I want to say one quick thing. This is what American Public Square is, right? This is why we are here. I'm so grateful to hear opinions that aren't the same, that are different. We need this because if you don't ever sit next to or talk to somebody who doesn't believe the same as you do, we never bridge those gaps, right? And so this is why American Public Square is here. And I'm just so grateful to each of you for participating in this panel. I'm also grateful for all of you all for coming out this evening here in person. Thank you for being so engaged as an audience. This has been wonderful. We have so many, we have a stack of questions over here, okay? Wow. So what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to see if we can get some of our panelists to answer these questions maybe by video and post them on our website or maybe through a blog post um, because we would love to hear your opinions on these questions, okay? So we promise that we will try to get that done. Um, I also wanna thank the folks who joined us online. People online were having a very robust conversation, not always civil. <laughs> I had to delete a few comments. That was me that did that, yes. My goodness. <laughs> no men bashing, none of that is gonna happen on our watch. So that was my ringing the civility bell online. So <laughs> thank you all for, for, for being so participatory. So as we close out this evening, I really would like to um, express a special appreciation for our civics education initiative sponsors, the Sherman Family Foundation, the McDonald Family Foundation, and the Openstein Brothers Foundation. Thank you for trusting our vision for the next generation, helping to strengthen and protect our democracy. Thank you to tonight's moderator, Moray Williams, and our panelists. Thank you to Toriano for serving as our roving reporter this evening. And thank you to Dr. Matt Reeves and his crew for fact-checking tonight. A real special shout out to our teachers and our students who are here with us this evening. They did a lot of work helping us get this program put together. And I want to mention, for those of you who don't know, our student ambassadors came from six different schools across our city. So we have urban, suburban, and I call it rural, but some people may not, rural schools represented. We also have private, parochial, public, and public charter schools that are represented through our student ambassadors. So when we talk about bridging those, making those bridges and building them, we're serious about that. Um, tomorrow, you will receive an email with a link to a short post-event survey. Please take a moment to fill that out. We love to hear um, your feedback and it's valued and we read every single solitary comment.
Um, I would like to take a moment to invite you to our event on May 24th. We are going to talk climate. And just like these folks up here don't agree, the folks we have coming for climate don't agree either. So that's going to be really exciting. You can check our, uh, our website, AmericanPublicSquare.org, to get more information about that. Um, one last thing. So... Our work at APS is made possible through people who join American Public Square as members. If you are not a member of American Public Square, I want to invite you to join APS tonight. You can join online at AmericanPublicSquare.org or you can stop at one of our tables out here. And as a special gift, if you join this evening, we will gift a complimentary membership to a person of your choice, okay? So we would love to have you all join APS. Now, I want to welcome two more of our student ambassadors up to, oh, three more of our student ambassadors up to close us out this evening. <sighs> Apologies. <laughs> uh, on behalf of American Public Scare, we will be presenting our moderators and each of our panelists with an engraved civil, uh, civility bell. We hope these come in handy as you seek to engage in civil, fact-based conversations at home, at work, and in the community. We would, like to, sorry. we would like to leave everyone with this final thought. The following is a quote from the book, The Big Sort, by Bill Bishop and Robert Cushing. In a country that is dividing by economic prospects, by years of education, by the look and feel of what constitutes a family, and by political persuasion, we continue to believe that there might be a more important message we all need to hear. The message people living in democracy must understand more than any other message is that there are Americans who aren't just like you. They don't live like you, they don't have families like yours, and they don't think like you. They may not live in your neighborhood, but this is their country too. Thank you all for coming out and good night. May we see you all again. <laughs> <laughs>